Peace be upon you. So in forming a contract, the objective is to try to cover every possible conceivable situation, such that if one of these situations transpires, you already have the plan as far as who's responsible, what the outcome is going to be. And the purpose of doing this is to mitigate potential disputes that might arise if one of these unforeseen events takes place. A contract that accounts for all possible scenarios that is rock solid is considered a complete contract. But in actuality, there's no such thing as a complete contract. We can each aim to try to create a complete contract, but inevitably, there's going to be conditions and scenarios that are unaccounted for. That's the reason that when we fill out these terms of service agreements, when using a product or service, they get progressively longer because each time there's a new lawsuit, a new uh, situation arises, you know, lawyers, they go and create new clauses, new stipulations to safeguard against such an outcome. And it doesn't matter how much time and energy and thought someone puts into something like this, they will never be able to cover all the edge cases that are unaccounted for. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld, in a famous speech, said there's known knowns, these are things that we know we know, there's unknown knowns, things that we know we don't know, and then the unknown unknowns, things that we don't even know we don't know. And this is always what ends up happening, is that individuals uh, fail to foresee all these scenarios uh, when forming a rule, a contract, or anything of this sense. And a lot of times, people take advantage of this. Um, in one instance, in 1999, the packaged food company, Healthy Choice, did a promotion where they were offering 1,000 uh, airline travel miles for every 10 Healthy Choice barcodes that a participant mailed back to the company. What they didn't realize was that there was an individual ready to game the system, and since they didn't put any uh, contingency to how many times one individual could participate in this, what this person figured out was that they could buy a pudding cup for about 25 cents and be able to participate in this promotion. So they spent some $3,000 buying 12,000 cups of pudding. And that accumulated to 1.2 million airline miles. And that's enough miles to fly around the earth 48 times. And it's because, again, these the individuals who created the sweepstakes didn't foresee this possible outcome. And because of that, they suffered losses. Um, there's a similar scenario with American football. When it was first introduced to colleges, the rule book was pretty sparse. So teams came up with these clever hacks on how they could get the upper hand. So for instance, uh, in one incident, they uh, sewed fake footballs to the jersey to throw off the other team as far as who actually had the ball. Uh, other plays, they would literally run off field, go around the bleachers, and then when the play started, run back onto the end zone, ready for a long pass. Eventually, the officials had to update the rules to account for these kind of scenarios, people gaming the system. And this is the challenge that any human-made system will face, that we will never be able to account for all the miscellaneous edge cases when forming a rule book or contract. There will always be issues and scenarios that we forget to account for, and therefore we'll have to constantly be updating the material to uh, adjust for these unforeseen events. This is what makes the Quran unique. Because unlike any other document, uh, law, rule book created by men that will always have possible unforeseen edge cases that are unaccounted for, the Quran covers all the possible events that have to do with our religious salvation and the laws necessary for us to be able to make it to paradise. In Surah 6, verse 114 and 115, it reads, Shall I seek other than God as a source of law when he has revealed to you this book fully detailed? Those who receive the scripture recognize that it has been revealed from your Lord truthfully. You shall not harbor any doubt. The word of your Lord is complete in truth and justice. Nothing shall abrogate his words. He is the hear, the omniscient. These verses are epically clear that the Quran should be our only source of law. 
And the reason is, is because this book is complete and fully detailed. And this is repeated throughout the Quran. In Surah 41 verse 3, it says a scripture whose verses provide the complete details in an Arabic Quran for people who know. God tells us that the Quran contains explanations for everything. In Surah 16 verse 89, it says the day will come when we will raise from every community a witness from among them and bring you as a witness of these people. We have revealed to you this book to provide explanations for everything and guidance and mercy and good news for the submitters. We see again in 1037, it says this Quran could not possibly be authored by other than God. It confirms all previous messages and provides a fully detailed scripture. It is infallible for it comes from the Lord of the universe. These verses clarify that anything having to do with our religious salvation or religious laws must be included in the verses of the Quran. In Surah 31 verse 27 it reads, If all the trees on earth were made into pens and the ocean supplied its ink augmented by seven more oceans, the words of God would not run out. God is almighty, most wise. God is informing us that if he wanted to, he could have made this Quran volumes and volumes long. Yet he limited it to these 6,346 verses. That these are all the words we need for our religious salvation. This is again echoed in Surah 18 verse 109. It says, say, if the ocean were ink for the words of my Lord, the ocean would run out before the words of my Lord run out, even if we doubled the ink supply. God put everything we need for a religious salvation in this book. That's why it repeatedly tells us that it's complete, it's fully detailed, it has explanations for everything. But when people are looking at alternative sources for religious laws, it's showing that they don't believe in God's words in this Quran. They think that either God made a mistake or he forgot. In Surah 19 verse 64 it says, we do not come down except by the command of your Lord. To him belongs our past, our future, and everything between them. Your Lord is never forgetful. God did not forget to tell us how to sleep, which foot we need to use when we enter the restroom, how to bathe, how to urinate, how to cut our nails. Yet the fabricators of such false doctrine as Hadith and Sunnah have come up with religious teachings dictating on their followers how to do these things that tell them how they're supposed to bathe, how they're supposed to urinate, how they're supposed to cut their nails, which foot they're supposed to use to enter the bathroom. This absurdity, these additional laws that contradict the Quran, that make it seem as if God forgot to put these in the Quran if they were needed for our religious salvation. If God did not provide guidelines for these things in the Quran, then it is another source that these people are setting up to rival the word of God in the Quran. If God did not include certain aspects in the Quran, it is because of one of two reasons. The first reason is that it's not pertinent to our salvation. The best depiction of this is in the following example with the children of the cave and how many of them there were. In Surah 18 verse 22 it reads, Some would say there were three, their dog being the fourth, while others would say five and six being their dog. As they guessed, others said seven and the eighth was their dog. Say, my Lord is the best knower of their number. Only a few knew the correct number. Therefore, do not argue with them, just go along with them. You need not consult anyone about this. God could have specified these aspects in the Quran and God is telling us that if he didn't put it there, if he didn't tell you specifically, it's not important. Don't worry about it. People who are looking for alternative sources to understand how to bathe, in essence, are saying that God forgot to put this in the Quran, that this is something that's pertinent to our salvation. They're creating religious laws that are never authorized by God. And why is it that people who are religious tend to over-prohibit, tend to over-regulate uh, rather than following the words of God in the Quran. We saw this example with the children of Israel, how they over-prohibited what foods they were allowed to eat, how they created all these extraneous laws that God never authorized. And you see the traditional Muslims doing the exact same thing. The second reason to why something might not have been included in the Quran 
is because God deliberately overlooked these items by design. In Surah 5, verse 101, it reads, O you who believe, do not ask about matters which, if revealed to you, prematurely would hurt you. If you ask about them in the light of the Quran, they will become obvious to you. God has deliberately overlooked them. God is forgiver, clement. God is telling us here that there are certain aspects, obvious things, that appear that he overlooked, but God did this by design. That there is a specific reason. And at that time, when someone is ready, God will reveal that reason to them. God in Surah 20 verse 114 says, Most exalted is God, the only true King. Do not rush into uttering the Quran before it is revealed to you, and say, My Lord, increase my knowledge. This is a process that we have to grind through learning the Quran, that it takes time. It's not like a regular book where you read it once and automatically you know everything. That you have to implore God to give you the clarity, the understanding, and by God's leave, if we deserve it, if the timing is right, God will reveal these matters to us. But we have to be patient. We have to be steadfast. To go and look for these supposed answers in alternative sources is showing that A, we don't believe in God's words in the Quran, that it's complete and fully detailed, and B, we're trying to gain God's system, that we're looking for a shortcut to get these answers. God is telling us, if you take one of these shortcuts, you go to these alternative sources, all you're going to do is lead yourself astray. Because it's the devil who's the one who inspires his allies to create these sources. In Surah 6 verse 112 it reads, We have permitted the enemies of every prophet, human and jinn devils, to inspire in each other fancy words in order to deceive. Had your Lord willed, they would not have done it. You shall disregard them and their fabrications. And it tells us the reason God allowed this to happen in the following verse in Surah 6 verse 113. It says, This is to let the minds of those who do not believe in the hereafter to listen to such fabrications and accept them, and thus expose their real convictions. When someone goes looking for answers for religious laws in sources outside of the Quran, outside of the, the actual word of God, it's showing they don't believe in God's words and they don't actually believe in God. And if you don't believe in God, then you don't believe in the hereafter. But there's another fundamental problem with following any other hadith beside the Quran. There's not a soul in the world who will claim that the hadith is complete. Even the followers of the hadith perpetually debate with each other which hadith are to be followed and which ones are to be rejected. There is no unanimous consensus as far as which hadith are absolutely authentic, should be followed, and which ones are fabricated. Even Bukhari himself eliminated 99% of the hadith he collected and said they're untrustworthy. So by definition, most Muslims who even claim to follow the Hadith are Hadith rejectors. They just don't realize it. They debate with one another over which Hadith to be accepted, which one isn't. And this is because the Hadith, unlike the Quran, is not a complete book. This is because the Hadith does not contain the full context. This is why you have numerous Hadith that have different narrations, different contexts, different details that constantly contradict one another. So people are perpetually debating which one to uphold, which one is authentic, which one isn't, and making these uh, justifications for it. But let's say we have a way to get a authentic hadith, a 100% authentic hadith, some phrase that the Prophet said. Even if this hadith was validated, Let's say we had some ability to be able to hear this hadith. The reality is, it's not the complete hadith. It's only a snippet of what the Prophet said. Meaning that there's no way to compile all the details, all the context that's necessary to understand that hadith. Because again, the hadith are not a complete book. They're fragments of narration that consistently contradict one another. And I'll give you an example. There are several hadith. These are Sahih Hadith, where the Prophet says that anyone who simply says, La ilaha illallah, there is no God beside God, will enter paradise. So for instance, this is one, it says, the Prophet said, whoever says there is no God but Allah enters paradise. And here's another Hadith, it says, whoever says there is no God but Allah enters paradise, even if he commits adultery, 
even if he steals, even if he commits gross sins. Now, if someone accepts this hadith, now they, they genuinely believe that as long as someone utters this sound, La ilaha illallah, that they are guaranteed to be able to make it to paradise. Now, these are trustworthy, sahi hadith. Now, let's assume someone accepts this. They uphold this. Not only does this contradict the Quran, but there's other hadith that claim that, oh, some of the context is missing. So, for instance, there's another Bukhari uh, Sahih hadith. It says, if anyone comes on the day of resurrection who has said, La ilaha illallah, sincerely with the intention to win Allah's pleasure, Allah will make hellfire forbidden for him. So, if you accept hadith beside the Quran, who's to say which of these narrations is right? Because one claims that the Prophet said that all that is required for someone to eventually make it to paradise, that in some instances it says that the fire will never touch them, is simply to utter, La ilaha illallah. But this other one says that no, there has to be an element of sincerity with the intention to win Allah's pleasure. So which one is someone to uphold? They contradict one another. Is it the former or the latter? So here we have different contexts. If some people say they accept the, uh, the, the first context and reject the other, then they become hadith rejectors, and vice versa. But these kind of disputes inevitably pose two major problems. Firstly, that the hadith are not a consistent source causing most people who even promote hadith to admit that by upholding hadith, they are actually admitting that they reject most hadith. This goes back to the concept that if you accept one of these hadith, it means you have to reject the other hadith because, again, they contradict one another. And this is a big reason why you have so many sects within Islam. You have millions of permutations. No two people believe the same thing. All of them have different interpretations as far as which hadith to uphold, which ones to reject. And because of this, they're in perpetual disagreement with one another. And the irony is that the reason they have these disagreements is because they're not following the Quran alone. The book that God tells us is complete. It's fully detailed. It has explanations for everything. But the second reason why having these various narrations and all these hadith that contradict one another is such a problem is because what if you don't have the full context? In these hadith, we see that they contradict one another and each one is supposed to shed a little more light to the, the saying that was said. But this is assuming that we have the full picture, the full gamut of what took place, the context, who was speaking, uh, what was happening, all these other factors at play. And the only way that we'd be able to justify any other hadith to say that it's complete is if we were able to have every single word, phrase, saying, scenario that the Prophet went through to be able to understand the full context, which is a physical impossibility. And this draws back to the aspect that the only consistent source, the only complete scripture that we are to use that is fully detailed, has explanations from everything, and the authentic stamp of approval from God is that of the Quran, because it has no contradictions. In Surah 39, verse 29, it reads, God cites the example of a man who deals with disputing partners. This is equivalent to Hadith compared to a man who deals with only one consistent source. This is the Quran. Are they the same? Praise be to God. Most of them do not know. God is telling us those who deal with disputing partners, a non-consistent source, is no different than the ones who are dealing with Hadith. But the ones who are dealing with a consistent source are the believers who follow and uphold the Quran alone. You know, some Muslims, they compromise by stating, if a Hadith agrees with the Quran, they will accept it. And if it contradicts the Quran, they will reject it. Such premise proves that these people do not believe God's assertions, that the Quran is complete, perfect, and fully detailed. The moment they seek guidance from anything besides the Quran, no matter how right it seems, they fall into Satan's trap, for they have rejected God's word and set up another God besides God. In Surah 18, verse 57, it reads, Who are more evil than those who are reminded of their Lord's proofs, then disregard them without realizing what they are doing. Consequently, we place shields on their hearts to prevent them from understanding it, and deafness in their ears. Thus, no matter what you do to guide them, 
they can never be guided. People who are reminded of the majesty of this Quran, yet choose to go and search for other sources for religious laws, are proving that they don't deserve this Quran, and because of that they are locked out. In Surah 17, verse 45 and 46, it reads, When you read the Quran, we place between you and those who do not believe in the hereafter an invisible barrier. We place shields around their minds to prevent them from understanding it, and deafness in their ears. And when you preach your Lord using the Quran alone, they run away in aversion. If we want to uphold the words of Muhammad, we should uphold the Quran alone. On the Day of Judgment, Muhammad is going to make the following claim against his people. He's going to tell God, based on Surah 25, verse 30, that my Lord, my people have deserted this Quran. Notice no mention of Hadith, no mention of Sunnah, that this is the claim that Prophet Muhammad is going to make against his people. So let's not make this mistake. If we want to support God and his messengers, then we should uphold the Quran alone and nothing else beside that. God willing, we're going to end there. If you guys got comments or questions, please hit us up at Talk at gmail.com. If you want to follow along the verses of the Quran, please download the Quran Study app on the iOS app store or go to the QuranStudyApp.com website. And if you like the podcast, please share it with other people, leave us a review, and until next time, peace and God bless.